Alan's personal growth journey all started in 1988 when he picked up the book Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. In 1994, he attended his first landmark forum and helped establish the business in South Africa. Today, Alan is one of Tony Robbins' elite group of, of trainers. Alan also runs his own workshops and seminars, and I recently attended the three-day event Awaken, and it blew my mind away. So many breakthroughs, emotions being shared, and limiting beliefs being broken down. It truly opened up my heart. And Alan, I'm honored to have you as my guest on my show today. Thanks, Sonia. It's great to be here. Alan, what started you out on your personal growth journey? Um, I was introduced to Think and Grow Rich, the book, you know, the classic book, Think and Grow Rich I by Napoleon Hill. Yes. A very famous book that most people have heard of. Uh, it was the beginning of a fantastic journey. It exposed me to education that I'd never been exposed to before, personal development. And uh, I, it, the book blew me away. I just thought, wow, this is amazing. This is what they should be teaching at school. You know, how come I waited so long to find that kind of information? You know, why, why don't they give us that when we were much younger? That was the first thoughts I had when I read that book. And what made you turn to the book? Was it a certain turning point in your life or do you... It was a recommendation from a friend of mine. Okay. Um, I had just come out of the military about six months before that. Well, it was July when I read that book, so about seven months. Um, I'd been out of the military and a friend of mine who was also in the military at the same time, uh, same time as me, who was on the same operation as me, uh, he recommended I read the book. And when you were, you were in the Angolan War, right, which was a particularly bloody war um, that took place in South Africa, um, well, in, in Angola, mm. what, what sort of experiences did you have? Uh, brutal, uh, horrific experiences, yeah, South Africa was... Um, was asked to go into Angola, um, you know, a number of different times, and uh, in '87, when, it was in, when which is when I was called up there, which is when I was deployed in Angola with the 5,000 other soldiers, um, it was, uh, you know, it was a rough time. Uh, the war had been going on for many years; many lives were lost, and um, South Africa was there covertly when I was called up there. When I was deployed there, it was a covert operation, so nobody knew we were up there. We'd been sworn to secrecy, and it was. Um, as horrific as war can get, you know. I mean, it's this kind of stuff you see in movies, really, but even worse. And how, I mean, you can't have been that old. No, how was, old uh, were you when I you were? I was 20. You were 20? Mm. Wow. So, as a 20 year old, you're coming out of that situation. I mean, how did you feel leaving that? What sort of memories did you have and how did it affect you? Uh, well, I had nightmares for a long time after that, and I had post traumatic stress. Uh, that showed up in um, anxiety. I was always anxious. I was, um, had severe mood swings. Uh, I was drinking a lot just to numb myself to uh, what I was feeling and um, also to try and um, I would drink myself into, I'd drink myself to sleep really so I didn't have any nightmares. I, I noticed very quickly that if I, uh, drank, my, if I drank a lot, I wouldn't have nightmares. So uh, to what, avoid what having nightmares, nightmares, I drank a lot. I would always have um, recurring nightmares of me running through the bush with the enemy chasing me and often myself carrying a baby through the bush, um, which later on, after many years of, of you know, introspection and, and self-study and a lot of personal development, I, I came to recognize that I was carrying my own inner child, you know, trying to protect myself. Um, so that was the, 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 the meaning that I gave to it after a while, you know. Wow. Mm. And in terms of the war itself, did, did you, I mean, you must have, you, you're fighting yes. for your survival. Did, did you yeah. actually kill anybody? Well, I used a patrol mortar pipe and an RPG-7 rocket launcher. So you may have seen these um, weapons in movies. And uh, a 60 millimeter mortar pipe is about this long. Um, you know, it's a 60 millimeter mortar, which is about this. You drop the mortar bomb inside the pipe and it, it's close combat. Uh, you know, it's used for close combat. And, um, and obviously an RPG sovereign rocket launcher is, is, a, is a rocket propelled grenade really, you know, and you use that to, you know, well, you fire that into buildings or into vehicles. In my case, I was firing that into vehicles, into enemy vehicles and dropping mortars on the enemy, um, you know, so um, providing the cover that our front line needed. I was right on the front line, well, just directly behind the front line of, 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 uh, of our riflemen or our soldiers, the military soldiers that were on the ground fighting. Um, so yeah, my job was to provide cover and to use um, the rocket grenades whenever it needed, you know, whenever it was w required. So yeah, to answer that question, yes. I mean, I can't imagine going through that or that must have 
felt like for you seeing presumably your friends around you yeah. being injured or, 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 killed. Or, or killed? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The very first combat we had, I saw three of my friends disappear in a puff of smoke. They were in a vehicle that was taken out by an enemy tank, a Russian tank. And, um, and one of them, another one who was also on the same, uh, in, in our same um, company, uh, he was in a different vehicle at the time who took a bit of shrapnel in the front of his head. I ended up giving him a blood transfusion. I didn't realize it was him until you I actually... actually... You gave him, like, literally... Yeah. It, were you medical or have you got... No, no, med medical? Uh, no, just after that, after that attack, a medic came running through the bush and, and said, who's got O-positive blood? And I said, me. And he said, follow me. And I followed him... Uh, through the bush and we arrived at this area where there was a bunch of soldiers being looked after by medics and um, you know receiving triage etc and and uh, he grabbed me and he put a needle in my arm and my blood flowed out of my arm down this tube into the arm of a soldier on the ground and I recognized it was a friend of mine and uh, unfortunately he bled out he didn't make it no I mean that sounds like something from a film <laughs> so you get over that you you're you, you come out of, of the army mm. um, and you said you had uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome and you were turning to drink yeah I started drinking heavily and um, just to you know just to as a way of numbing myself and to tr try and prevent myself thinking about what I was thinking all the time as I kept seeing you know flashes images you know um, seeing the same images around and around having these really dark thoughts um, and trying to process what I had seen and done you know I'd been to two Catholic schools when I was a kid so I had mm. religious dogma shoved in my brain from a young age also went to Sunday Gosh. school even before school so um, I was trying to come to terms with that fact, you know, that I'd um, been part of this, this war and also done what I'd done, you know, and taken lives and seen people die around me, etc. And uh, trying to process that is, is quite difficult, yeah. It took a long time. Uh, a lot of my friends never... You know, I had some friends who committed suicide thereafter, you know, who, who just couldn't get over that operation. Uh, one of them who went to school with me, a really lovely guy, and he was a great sportsman. He was um, a leader, he was a, the head boy at my school, and um, he never really got over that operation. He was in the same op as me. And, um, and what happened to him? He, he... He, yeah, after a number of years, he, he never was able to hold down a job. He was in and out of, um, you know, um, hospitals, psychiatric wards, etc. And then eventually he just took his own life. Terrible. So is there any, I mean, were you given support? How did you... Yeah, we had, we had, um, this? We, we, when we, as soon as we were flown out of Angola and we were relieved, by the next intake of soldiers uh, who had obviously just finished their, their training and they were, came up to relieve us. We had been there for seven months at that time. This was now December, um, early December, and we were flown back to a rehabilitation camp where we were there for about 10 days. I don't remember much of that, but I do remember we got you know, clean underpants, clean socks, you know, hot food for the first time. Uh, hot showers, you know, that was all fantastic. And then we also spoke to psychologists, but I don't really remember any of that uh, at all, actually. It's very vague. It's funny. I'm, I'm just reading um, uh, Man's Search for Meaning at the moment, Viktor Frankl, mm. which obviously goes through the con his experience at the concentration camp and yeah. how he changes or, or looks at it in a different way. Mm. How do you look back now at what happened to you in Angola and, and sort of what, do you, what meanings do you take from that? I look back at that as a blessing now. Um, it's taken a long time, it's 30, it's 30 plus years now. Uh, but when I began to reframe that experience and started asking myself a different question, how can I use this experience rather than let this experience use me? And, um, and then I began to reframe it, you know, and started to, and I, I've read that book, Viktor Frankl's book, yeah. Man's Search yeah. for Meaning, powerful book. He survived four concentration camps, not just one, and then wrote about it, um, a very, very powerful book. And um, so I began to give it a different meaning, you know, and I started asking myself a different question. How can I use this experience? And then, um, you know, and then it, it dawned on me that, you know, I could, uh, if I could share that experience and learn from that experience and then, and it really helped me to develop a lot of compassion. Going through something like that and surviving something like that, you know, uh, and then, you know, learning everything I've learned over the last 30 years of personal development, you know, it gave me a really deep compassion for other human beings. You know, everybody's fighting their own battle. You don't have to have been at war mm. like I have. You know, everyone's fighting their own battle in their head, whether it's a, a mother trying to feed her kids or, you know, trying to, you know, clothe her children or, you know, um, a father doing the same thing or, you know, people going through a divorce or somebody trying to save their business or, you know, somebody who's, who's trying to climb out of a financial hole. Everybody's battling, you know, day to day. So, it gave me a tremendous amount of compassion for other people. And do you, I mean, do you use this in other areas of your life? Yeah. You know, you've, you, 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 
obviously it started you on your personal growth journey, mm. um, but how has that sort of taken you on in terms of what you're doing today? Uh, well, I've done a lot of, I've worked with military personnel, I've worked with police, ex-police personnel, I've worked with, um, you know, people who have really been uh, through some really traumatic experiences. And uh, it's really helped to serve me in terms of, as I said, compassion and empathy. And uh, I've learned a whole bunch of tools around trauma intervention. And now what I do is uh, I really help people to heal, you know, whatever they've been through in their life, whatever they're carrying with them. You know, I carried that with me for a long, long time and it really traumatized me. And it, it, uh, I suppressed it for a long time mm. didn't, without realizing that just by suppressing it, it was still affecting me. Uh, how was it kind affecting? Of, how did it sort of show up in your day-to-day -day life? Well, I was anxious <laughs> all the time. I was very angry. I was, um, you know, confrontational, aggressive. Um, That's not just being South African then. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, South Africans are known for being direct. <laughs> You're very direct. Yeah. Um, but I was, um, you know, it, it affected me in all kinds of ways. And I didn't even realize it until, you know, now looking back. And, you know, when I, people who know me then and know me now, they say that I've changed so much. You know, I'm just definitely not the same person. I mean, I was always afraid to go out in public and I... I didn't really, I couldn't go out in public for a long, long time. I locked myself away for a long time in my bedroom. Just locked myself in my bedroom and drank myself to sleep for months. Um, when I first came out of the military, I didn't go out in public for at least seven or eight months. Wow. And uh, I, I just, yeah, it was very uncomfortable. And, um, and then for years after that, it was still uncomfortable. And I was always anxious and always kind of nervous, um, you know, always you know, at a nervous disposition um, and very quick to anger, uh, you know, and so... Uh, drinking didn't really help that either, you know, no, so it just makes it worse, yeah, it does. Yeah, and then I was obviously started using drugs, you know, and um, and it was a good way just to numb numb what I was feeling and just help me suppress. So you went from drinks to, to drugs. Yeah. And what what sort of how far did you take the drugs? Well, I, uh, I, I developed a bad cocaine habit and I uh, was using ecstasy on a regular basis and I would often use everything all together at the same time ecstasy cocaine marijuana and alcohol and you know, and I was also <laughs> smoking cigarettes. So um, and you're still alive. Right? And I would do that for, I did that for, for a number of years, you know, and I was um, doing it every weekend. I was doing like three, four day binges, you know, where I'd go out all night too. So uh, I was burning the candle at both ends for a long time. It was, um, it started to have an effect, you know, it started to take its toll. And I got to a point where I thought, hey, this has got to stop. And, um, you know, and then I was l looking for, you know, some kind of intervention in my own life. I'd read lots of books and even though I'd read the books and done a lot of work, I'd been to Landmark Education. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I went through, right through Landmark's curriculum, but even though I'd done all this personal development for, for it was about, about 11 years of really, you know, immersing myself in education around the mind and psychology and, you know, trauma, etc., and post-traumatic stress and behavior, etc., and, you know, mindset. Uh, I still wasn't making any kind of significant shift in my own life. So and you I was were still, still doing the drinking, the drugs uh, and all of that sort of stuff while And severely reading. unhappy and depressed, you know, and depressed. And I uh, spent a lot of time depressed. Um, but then it was when I went to UPW, Unleash Your Power Within, for the first time. That's the Tony Robbins yeah. event. The, the no. sort of two, the, was it four days? He, four I know day he event, does it yeah. here in London. I, I went yeah. a number of years ago. And, um, and that's when I, I, you know, I, made, <clears throat> I made a significant shift after that. I decided that enough was enough. And I just knocked everything on the head, got clean, and um, really started to apply what I'd learned and made some significant shifts in my life and then everything got better from there, you know? So it was really at that moment, that was your turning point, yeah. the Tony Robbins. Yeah. The, okay. Yeah, I arrived at that workshop with the, um, you know, the, what's the word? Uh, the commitment and the intention. Those are the right words. The intention and the commitment that I was gonna, this weekend was gonna be the weekend where I change everything. I was gonna really take my, my own understanding of my own psychology to a much deeper level. And I knew I was in the right environment to do that with the right teacher. You know, Tony's my favorite teacher. I've had many teachers in 30 years, but mm. he's definitely my, far my favorite. And, you know, somebody that I, rec that I, that I, that I um, regard as the smartest person when it comes to, you know, changing behavior and, and making significant shifts around mindset. And so I was ready. It was, you know, I went to that weekend with that intention. Uh, I was four days sober when I arrived at that weekend. And I had every intention of really understanding how I was going to stay clean and what I was going to make, what I was going to have to do to make that happen. And and I uh, and I came out of that workshop with all the answers to those questions, and uh, I met that intention, and uh, it was fantastic, you know. And I got back, and it wasn't easy, you know, but I just I hung around with, I changed my peer group. I was going to say, what kept you on that, you know? Because I yeah. went, and it was you're on. You've, 
you're euphoric for the next few days yeah. or the next week. Yeah. But then surely that sort of goes down after the event. You're a bit well, like, great, I can't say you rock to anybody else because everyone's looking at me like yeah. I'm mad. No, it's true. I, I conditioned it into my nervous system, just like Tony talks about success conditioning. And it's not only Tony who talks about that. You know, if you really want to be successful in life, you really need to condition yourself into the new, the new paradigm or into the new mindset or into the new behavior. You can't just go to a workshop and expect that everything's going to change and stay changed. Because that's what happens with most people. Mm -hmm. They slide backwards back into old habits because they frequent old peer groups. That's what I did. That was one of the most powerful things I did is I stopped hanging around with the same group that I was hanging around at that, that, that time, even though I loved them and I know them for many years, they're still my friends to this day, but we've all changed now. Mm. We're all adults now. We're all fathers, business people, etc. But at that time, I needed to make a shift for myself. Yeah. And so in order to make that stick, I needed to find a new group of people that were playing a game at a higher level, you know, people that would hold me accountable. And that's when I moved and I found a new peer group and it really supported me. So would you say to anybody, when they're at that really low point, they've, I mean, you, you went through a, a, a tremendous amount of um, stress, Dr drugs, drinking, if somebody's at a real low point, suicidal in life, are you saying just by going to a Tony Robbins event that that's going to shift them and change them? Yes, a weekend workshop like that can make a significant shift to someone's life. Because you've got to think, the reason that these workshops, workshops like this, and Tony's not the only one who does workshops like this, you know, the reason that they're so popular and effective is because when you are in that kind of environment for an immersive period of time, you immerse yourself, right? It's a long period of time the vibration of that environment is very high and everybody in that environment is raised to a higher level and people really can face whatever they've come to face. And so you can have a significant shift in a workshop like that. You can have, because people are ready to confront whatever they want to confront. And when you've got a, a very skillful facilitator like Tony, um, you know, it gives people the opportunity to look at what they don't want to look at when they're in their daily life, you know. And so you can have a, magnif you can have a massive shift, definitely, and I did. Uh, but then the key is to continue with what you've learned in that workshop, to continue, continue practicing what, you, what you've learned. And that's the challenge that most people face, is once they've gone to the workshop, they don't continue to practice what they've learned. They don't remove themselves from the old environments that they were spending time in or the toxic environments that they were spending time in before they went to the workshop. They don't make significant changes. And you have to make significant changes if you want something to stick. So significant changes, I mean, it's, it's all very well saying change your, or change your network, change your environment, but are you saying people should literally dump their friends and find new ones? And where are they going to find these new ones? It's well, I think that if, if you, this is a good question. I hear this question all the time, and I'll give you the same answer I'll give everyone. and say, if somebody's toxic, then you should spend less time with them. Define toxic. Well, if somebody's not serving you in any way, if they're negative, they're always complaining, if they always have drama in their life, if they're always looking at the glass half empty, if they are draining you of energy, then you should spend less time with them. Yeah. Tony's come under a lot of bad press recently um, for some of his interventions and what's happened mm. behind the scenes and how people have been affected. What, what <clears> would you say to that? I mean, I, I've been on your event um, and I was blown away. It was absolutely amazing. But you were getting people up and delving deep and they were bringing out all sorts of stuff mm. now you're not a qualified psychotherapist no but you were challenging them and you were delving deep as tony does is there any danger you think about opening somebody up and then just sort of letting them go and um when you say letting them go, what do you mean? Well, after the event, as you say, they, they've, they're not carrying on with that therapist. They've just been opened up and it's a little bit like, right, now what? You've just opened a can of worms. Yeah, well, the, the, the thing is, is that, uh, that to, when, if Tony or Mas, uh, and, you know, so to let me ask, you've asked me more than one question. Yes, there. So, I have. Let, so first of all, um, no, I'm not a qualified psychotherapist or psychologist or psychiatrist. However, I'm a practical psychologist. I see myself as a practical psychologist. What does that mean? That means I've read a whole bunch of psychology over 30 years and I've applied it in different areas and I've tested it in different and I've used it. And I've also, I'm also in an environment, you know, when you're working with someone who's, you know, freaking out, who's really dealing with some kind of trauma, you know, you have to be flexible in your approach, right? Because yeah. people are set in their patterns. And flexibility allows you to make it, allows you to interrupt that pattern. And if you want to help someone to make a change, you have to interrupt the pattern because all behavior is a pattern. You know? And so what happens is, uh, in in if you took any of my workshop out of context, if you were in the work, you know, talking about the workshop you came to mind, yes. my awakened workshop. If you took any of that out of context, if some, so let's say someone filmed any of that out of, 
and then and then edited that and then put it online and it was out of context. Mm. Anyone who watched that wouldn't understand what was going on there, and they would say that I was a I was a yeah, psycho. Yeah, completely. Right? And I can, yeah. I, you know, having been there, exactly. I can I, I can see that. So it's the same with Tony, right? Um, you know, people have taken some of his stuff out of context. They've edited it. They've misrepresented it. They've miscommunicated it, and um, and it's and obviously they're having a go at him. But I've been with Tony for 20 years and I've seen him do all kinds of interventions. I had one with him myself. So in terms of your own career, and you look at Tony Robbins, I mean, do you think of yourself as a, as a South African version of Tony Robbins? No, no. So when, I, when I first started out, I, I went back to South Africa and I launched my company in South Africa. I launched my, my, my own career in South Africa. So I started, you know, after I finished all of the training that I did and I got to a point where I thought, okay, cool, I've... I've trained in all these different modalities. Now I'd like to go back to South Africa and visit my, and see my parents. I hadn't seen them for 12 years. And I thought this would be a good place to start my own company, uh, my own training business, my own coaching business. And, um, and I went back there and, 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 yeah, for a while I thought I was, you know, and I, I, perhaps if you were watching me, I was acting like South Africa's Tony Robbins. And for a while, if I look back at me down, I think, wow, I'm, you know, perhaps I was, you know, cloning myself on Tony. But then... I suppose I was also finding my own way too, you know, I was uh, finding my own way with my own, um, with my own material, you know, and, um, you know, and developing my content, etc. But now, many years later, no, I've, I've got a very different approach. Um, my energy is very similar to Tony. I'm always very high. I've got to, always had a lot of high energy. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, I've got a very different approach, you know. Uh, I've developed my own content. I've, um, you know, taken it in a different direction. Uh, but at the same time, perhaps our mission is similar, you know, mm -hmm. and I think that's the same. I think the mission is similar for anybody who's in this game, really. It's like, you know, how can I serve? How can I make a difference? And that's always been the driver for me, is how can I make a difference? Even before, even before when I was a kid and growing up in South Africa, you know, I was a young kid in South Africa. I always looked around and thought, wow, something's not right here, you know. If you speak to some of the friends that I had when I was a kid, you know, before I became a teenager, they'll tell you that, you know, I was, you know, I remember one of my friends uh, we had this interaction with a, with an older black man in South Africa. I was we were about eleven or twelve. So this was when apartheid was, was yeah, right, right? When, in full, yeah. yeah in when, full. When, when apartheid was at its highest, and um, I, we were eleven or twelve, and I, and uh, we met this older black man, and he refused to look us in the eyes, and he was very subservient. And I said, please, you know, you my elder, you know, we should be looking up to you. You 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 can't even look us in the eyes. And I offered him my. Um, we had bought these chips, you know, these hot chips. Uh, we each had a bag of hot chips, and I gave him my hot chips. And um, my friend said, wow, you're one of the kindest people I know. And I remember that stuck in my head. Um, and, uh, you know, I've always, you know, fortunately, I had two very, I had two beautiful parents. And they always reminded me as a kid growing up in South Africa, never treat people by the color of their skin. You know, never judge people by the color of their skin. Always treat them by the character. Always give people the benefit of the doubt. My father taught me three rules in life. He said, be kind, be kind, be kind. Always be that's, kind. That's lovely. And he said, if you're kind to people, he said, that's all you really need because that'll help you wherever you go in life because kindness is a very powerful commodity that everybody understands. It's a universal language that everyone understands. You, know, you can't make any mistakes with anyone if you can't. So I always remember that. And, um, and I think, you know, my approach is, you know, how can I really help people to get past whatever they've been carrying with them for a long time like I did? I carried this stuff with me for so long and I got in the way, you know? And people are carrying this stuff with them all the time. So how can people get past that if they don't pick up the personal growth or a development book or they don't read Napoleon Hill? Yeah. What sort of suggestions, you know, there are low points. They'll be turning to a bottle, maybe turning yeah. to drugs. Well, I, well I, say to be, I say to people, listen, that all issues, all of your issues, no matter what they are, they started with the relationship with your parents when you were a kid. Because that's where you first learnt about punishment and reward. That's when you first learnt the false perception that love comes and love goes. Because when you were first scolded or beaten by your parents or spanked or, you know, or humiliated or you, first, you felt your first shame, that was your first interaction with your parents. Because, you know, something happened and suddenly you got scolded and you had never been scolded before that moment. Or you got spanked and you were never spanked before that moment. And that's when everything shifts. And so the greatest issues that we, that we, ch that we have as, as adults is uh, you can trace those all the way back to a dysfunctional relationship with our parents or both of them, one or two of them. And so I always tell people, even if you never pick up a personal development book, learn to forgive your parents for whatever you think they did wrong. Do you feel it's, I mean, as, as a woman, I will turn to my friends and I think that it's quite stereotypical for girls to, to talk or women to talk amongst themselves. Do you think it's the same with men? Um, 
No, women find it much easier to, yeah, to we, talk and open up. Men find it a lot harder. Uh, although now there's, there's a lot of campaigns out there now and there's a lot of men that are promoting you know, men's groups, etc. And encouraging men to open up, which is awesome. You know, to open up about things like about depression mm. and stress, mental health suicide, reasons. mental health, all of that, you know, which is fantastic. Uh, so more and more encouragement is out there now. However, there's, it's still, there's still a lot of men who struggle to actually you know, bring themselves to that kind of group and open up. So um, you know, men are, are behind women in that, in that you know, we're still quite behind the woman. Is there anything that you'd say to a man listening that may be going through some emotional stuff and how they sort of can reach out? Or Yeah, just uh, I would say um, there's power in vulnerability. You know, for men, we are afraid to be vulnerable as we think that's weak. Uh, however, you know, I learned, you know, uh, you know, through my own progress and um, going through this whole thing, you know, and all, everything I've learned in the last 30 years, I learned that vulnerability is very powerful. And if you can be vulnerable and authentic, then really people are so willing to, to support you. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, you know. It's not, there's nothing weak about being vulnerable. It's, it's actually very powerful and very courageous. And, um, you know, it's a tough thing to do to ask for help, especially for men, you know, because they, we, 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 tr we have been conditioned to be strong, you know, and, uh, you know, we have to be strong. We've got to manly, we've got to be men. And you hear things like man up and, you know, which, all these terrible phrases, you know, which really prevents men from actually asking for help. But that's what really kills men, isn't it? That's why suicide is so much higher amongst men, uh, because they're afraid to ask for help because they're expected to be strong. And so that, that at seems, you know, just seems like it's very, it's, 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 a, it's tempting, isn't it, and attractive for men, as it seems like, okay, that's going to end everything. That's going to end all the suffering, and then the suffering will be over. Talking of vulnerability and expressing emotions, a lot of that came out of the three-day event. Talk to me a little bit about that event. I mean, it, it blew my mind. There was a lot of people expressing their emotions mm. and bringing out um, their vulnerabilities. You were going back into people's past, looking at their self-limiting beliefs. How, how do you get that from people? You re were really delving deep, and I was so... like I couldn't believe that complete strangers were standing up and bearing all, literally mm. stripped bare naked. Mm. How do you do that? What it is that, uh, well, first and foremost, I always, my intention is always to provide a safe space for people to open up. Uh, people love opening up if you give them the opportunity because, listen, you know, when somebody's been carrying something with from them for a long time, it's tiring. It, you know, it's a burden. Mm. And um, so when people feel they have a safe space, then they'll open up. And then also what I do to, um, to really lead that process is I, I'm completely vulnerable and I'm completely authentic and you, you know you were in the workshop and I opened up about my own life too that I don't hold anything back I'm fully transparent and that gives other people the space to do that and so when they feel they have a safe space and they've been led by the facilitator in that way then you know you get people who are willing to share because they they're ready to unburden and they've got to that point and they come to that workshop people come to that workshop with an intention of their own they come there because they know you know they, they they're not going to enroll for a workshop like that knowing you know, without knowing why they've come there. To, they're coming to work on something specifically. They might not know what that is to the depth that they think. And then obviously when they get there, they suddenly realize there's more to it, you know, and, and they surprise themselves. But you've seen the process, right, during that wake, Awaken workshop, you know, yeah. the three-day process. Completely By the time people get to the third day, they, they're completely different people, yeah. right? They've let go of a lot of stuff. They've, they've been carrying. It's kind of like you arrive at the workshop carrying a, a a backpack full of rocks, right? But I mean, these guys has Louis Vuitton cases full of them. I mean, I was I was blown away yeah. with some of the stuff that was coming out, and people have been carrying this stuff, this baggage for years and years, decades, with, oh, decades yeah. without. Well, we carry a lot of us carry the stuff. Well, most of us carry the stuff since our since our childhood, since our early years, because it all starts there. You know, as I said earlier, it starts with your your initial parents. It you know, starts with your initial relation with your parents and then it evolves from there and then you form your identity and then you know, most of us are walking around with a flawed identity. It's not really who we are. It's a mask. You know? We've got different masks for different environments. So that environment that, I provide, that I've created there, it gives people the ability to actually introduce themselves to themselves at an authentic level and then learn how they can be themselves authentically without worrying about what other people think. And, you know, and then it, it just frees people up and gives them you know, the ability to forgive you know what they need to forgive, let go, which is forgive just seems to, means to let go, right? They want to let it gives people the ability to let go of anything that's been hindering them, you know, or stopping them, or 
or you know, anything that's been preventing them from being their own authentic self. Forgive is an interesting word, and I know we touched on it mm. in your course, where uh, people had been, there was, I think it was a, a lady there that had been abused by her father and her uncle. And yet you talk about forgiveness. Now, most of the population that are sort of coming into that, maybe not from day one of your course, would be like, you're, you're asking somebody to forgive their abuser? Surely it's the abuser that should be, you know, asking for forgiveness. I'm not asking them to forgive the abuser. What I'm showing them is that there's more freedom in letting go the interpretation or the meaning that they've given that experience. Because you remember, when you have an experience, it's not the experience that hurts you. It's the meaning you give it, right? So you can have three people who have the same experience and one of them gives it an empowering meaning and lives an empowering life and the other two give it a disempowering meaning end up bitter and unhappy for the rest of their lives and get ill. Right? So it's always the meaning, the frame we give it. So, all, so what I'm doing in the workshop is I'm helping them to create a new frame that gives them freedom to be more powerful in their own life rather than carrying that and looking at their, their future or their present through this old filter from their past. So, you know, if that means forgiving their abuser, yeah, for sure, there's freedom in that. Um, and, you know, during the workshop, you know, and, you know, this interview, this chat yeah, gives, very, gives people a very yeah, small idea of what's available in that workshop. But that workshop is designed to help people to understand the spiritual experience of their life, yeah, right? Because this physical experience we're having is only part of it, right? It's the smallest part of it. So we have to understand, well, what's the real reason that we came here and why we had these experiences and considering we manifest everything in our life, you know, and that may be a challenge for some people to take on. People say, well, what do you mean? I only manifest the good stuff. I don't, like, I don't, I don't manifest the bad stuff. That's someone else's problem. <laughs> someone else gave that to me. But that's not entirely true because then you've got no real power in your life. You know, you manifest everything and you, learn, you have to learn to take 100% responsibility. So then what that means is then you've got to look at, okay, cool, why have I had these experiences and what is it that I need to learn and you know, what am I, you know, what's the, where's the evolution available in this, in this experience? You know? The spiritual debate we could go on and talk about yeah. forever, but I'm just very conscious of time. Alan, where can people find out more about you and when are you running the next event? Uh, my next workshop, I'm not sure when that is yet, right at, now at the moment because I'm uh, doing a couple uh, uh, internationally. Well, actually, I suppose I do know when that is then. Uh, the answer to that question is the next one is in October in Romania, in Bucharest. Okay, guys, uh, Romania. But I'm not sure when the next one is in the UK. Okay. Uh, but people can find out about me online. They can find out, you know, they just use my name, type my name in Google, and they find me on Facebook, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, etc. Right, and, find and we'll my website. put it all in the show notes as well. Alan, what does the future hold for you? Uh, more fun, uh, more love, um, more adventure. I like traveling. Um, more transforming lives. I love doing that. You know, I love doing that. Um, yeah. And my final question, if you were to write a message in a bottle that mm. was going to be found for future generations in perhaps 50 years time, mm. what would that message be? Forgive quickly, love more, and remember everything's always on the way, nothing is in the way. Alan, thank you so much for being my guest on my show today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been fun.